The Flickering Lamp by Margaret Edishaw The Flickering Lamp is a sequence of nine poems written and performed by Margaret Edershaw. They tell something of the life and work of Florence Nightingale, the renowned Victorian lady who almost single-handedly invented modern methods of hygienic nursing and who refined her practice in the brutal conditions of the Crimean War. This year, 2020, is the bicentenary of Florence's birth. The poems are in the form of dramatic monologues. Characters from Florence's life, real and imaginary, speak in their own voices. Florence Nightingale was born in Florence on May 12, 1820. Her family was wealthy and they owned two country estates in England, Embley Park in Hampshire and Lee Hurst in Derbyshire. Her parents were Unitarians and they favoured a classical education for girls. So Florence studied school subjects such as Latin, German, French and Italian, as well as mathematics. Early in her life, Florence expressed the desire to become a nursing sister, but her parents forbade her to undergo training for a profession which they considered to be menial. As a young woman, Florence turned down a number of marriage proposals. She explained that she wanted something more from life than the simple duties and pleasures of marriage and domesticity. The first poem is called Only the Male Nightingale Sings. It is set at Lee Hurst House, one of the family estates. In the poem, Florence, employing classical myth, metaphorically confronts a patriarchal world of limitation which she will seek to defy. The house throws a crooked shadow across sloping grass towards a tangle of trees that hang over the rush and roar of the river Derwent and nearby mill chimneys press their smutty fingers against a ceiling wax sky. Through the dusk A cock nightingale trills, whistles, crescendos. The female flutters her dull wings, feels the thorn in her breast, longs to imitate those soaring notes, suffers the misery of silence. She refuses to accept a mate or weave a nest. She dances reluctantly on her perch, fears madness in a gilded cage. She yearns to fly away and taste the colour of the wind. In 1850, and despite the vehement objection of her parents, Florence enrolled as a nursing student at the Institution of Protestant Deaconesses at Kaiserwerth in Germany. The course lasted two years. When she returned to London, she began her nursing career at a Harley Street medical practice. In October 1853, the Crimean War broke out. The combatants were Russia on the one side and the Allies, Great Britain, France and the Ottoman Empire on the other. And the main theatre of war was the Crimean Peninsula. The first major engagement of the war was the so-called Battle of Alma, September 20th, 1854. In order to attack Sevastopol, a major port on the Black Sea, and thus to neutralise the Russian Black Sea fleet, the Allies had to cross the river Alma under heavy artillery fire and then to take a strongly fortified hilltop redoubt. Over 2,000 Allied lives were lost in the fighting and many injured soldiers finished up in hastily organised but poorly supplied field hospitals. 
The next poem is spoken by one of these injured soldiers. Let's call him George, of the heroic 28th Gloucester Regiment. The poem is called After Alma. After a week on the stormy Bosphorus, they mule bump our stretchers to a grimy hospital corridor, pilous like driftwood, washed up on a foreign shore. The wounded lie quiet, resigned to their fate. No doctors, no food, no water. Beside me, Michael, comrade of the 28th, bleeds through a gaping hole in his chest. His breath rattles and wheezes like an old barrel organ. He asks, what is death then, George? I say, death might be just a great darkness. Bit of peace and quiet to do me, he says. I observe death's many faces here, some lying on their backs with wild staring eyes as if death stole up like a surprise. Others fight to the last, roaring to drive away the grim reaper. The lucky ones just fall asleep. Michael wakes from a troubled doze. Have my watch, he says, in my pocket. I admire his handsome watch. Then he asks, what time is it? And a crooked smile at the question. His rattling breath ceases. One minute alive, the next quite dead. And the pocket watch has stopped too. I wonder why humans don't do what cats do. Slip away from home, find a private place for the final moment. And shall this soldier live? Or shall this soldier die? There's seven hundred Gloucester men will know the reason why. Initially, no female nurses were deployed to the Crimea to support the Allied forces. But in late 1854, Florence received a letter from the Secretary of War, Sidney Herbert, who was a good friend of Florence's family. In the letter, Herbert invited Florence to organise a corps of female nurses to travel to Scutari, east of Istanbul, to support the war effort. Within a few weeks, Florence had recruited just such a corps, and it arrived in Scutari in November. Florence would remain there and in associated hospitals for the next 18 months, an 18 months that would transform her life and fundamentally revolutionise the practice of hospital nursing worldwide. A contemporary British artist, Jerry Barrett, went to Scutari to make a visual record of campaign events. He asked for permission to paint the scene of Florence's arrival with her nurses. He sketched the scene and then worked this up into a full-blown oil painting. This is now shown in the National Portrait Gallery in London. In the painting, Florence stands left of centre, tastefully lit, her right hand seeming to bless the injured soldier at her feet. In the next poem, Florence is imagined to be writing to Barrett in order to express her unflattering response to the picture's romanticisation of the event, and indeed of her. The poem is named after the picture, The Mission. Dear Mr Barrett, I have neither time nor inclination to sit for your painting of our arrival in Scutari. However, I am informed by friends who have seen the draft of your picture that it reminds them somewhat of Caravaggio's The Raising of Lazarus. As he, you place centrally a recumbent man tended by a kneeling woman. Poor Mary Magdalene see Mrs Roberts, they tell me. Behind the recumbent man stands a woman, clad in grey, with a white cap, presumably me. 
and she is caught in a ray of light proceeding from the left, as is Christ in the Lazarus painting. Now, nursing is for me God's calling, but it is one of hard, practical work, not a mystery and certainly not a miracle. Arriving here was much less picturesque than your work would suggest. We struggled up from the port in November mud. Our welcome was six rooms for 42 nurses. No beds, no tables, no linen, no food, no medical supplies, not a basin, towel, nor bar of soap. In one of our six rooms lay the bloated, rotting corpse of a Russian general. Just a thought, Mr. Barrett, why don't you paint that? Yours sincerely, F. N. At Scutari, Florence recruited an Irish soldier, Robert Robinson, as her personal assistant and as a messenger. In the next poem, Robert recalls how this came about and he describes the new hospital regime operating in Scutari as instituted by Florence. The poem is called Angel of Mercy. When we docked at Constantinople, I was so sick they sent me to Scutari to join the wounded men from Alma who were lying on their dirty stretchers in the tatters of their bloodied uniforms. But the next month a miracle. To be sure, an angel of mercy appeared in the tidy form of Miss Nightingale and I became the angel's helper. From her first night to her last, I walked beside her along the four miles of beds, heard her voice clear as a small silver bell speak so kindly to the men, saw her shine, her flickering lamp over fellas sleeping, while others lifted their heads like weary birds just long enough to see her gliding by. I accompanied her on foot and horse between our two hospitals in all kinds of weather. Although a grand lady, she was tough and strong as my ma. Some doctors called Miss Florence espionage personified, frightened for sure that she would complain about them to the war office. Others referred to her slightingly as the bird, wanted to stop her work, banish nurses from their wards ignored her requisitions for food. But they were a pack of donkeys, outrun by a thoroughbred. Soon, Allied soldiers, badly injured in the conflict, began to be repatriated back to Britain. Queen Victoria visited some of these men in hospital and she was accompanied by members of the royal family. The busy Mr Barrett recorded the scene in yet another painting. Here in this poem, we imagine Queen Victoria writing in her journal about just such a visit. The poem is entitled, Eau de Cologne. Today, Prince Albert and I visited our poor wounded soldiers from the Crimea. Our dear sons accompanied us, also my cousin George. Since he fought at Alma, he trembles all over, like a leaf in a storm. One soldier, George Barton by name, talked so kindly to our boys, then he whispered to Albert that he'd been shot between the eyes. Didn't mind the scar, but regretted losing his sense of taste and smell. Nearby, lying motionless on a bed, was Private James Higgins, so pale and hollow-eyed and lost. He had no idea who I was. It brought an ache to my grieving heart to witness such suffering. Our dear son Edward was so sensitive to the soldier's pain that he shed a tear as we left. It makes one humble as well as proud that these ordinary men fight so bravely and unselfishly for our nation. I must write to Miss Nightingale 
and offer to send some special gifts for her Scutari patients. Some eau de cologne, perhaps, to combat the dreadful hospital smells. Florence returned to Britain after the end of the Crimean War, and because of the dreadful scenes that she had witnessed, she experienced a protracted period of depression and recurring nightmares. The next poem is one of these nightmares, as she returns in her mind to two other famous and bloody engagements of the war, Balaclava and Inkerman. Inkerman is said to have finally broken the will of the Russian army. The poem is called A Nosegay from Inkerman. I fail them. Now they rise, like mists drifting across the plains of Balaclava. Their pale faces crowd my windows, and heads wrapped in bloody rags share my pillow. Poor men, you suffered so much, dumb as lambs before a slaughter. I've been a bad mother to you. I left you lying in damp Crimean graves. Captain? Where are those bandages that I ordered last week? And we need socks, gloves, and 300 blankets. Come, let me wash you. Try a little soup, won't you? Oh, barely more than a child. You wrap the mantle around your face and die in silence. For my dead soldiers, I picked a nosegay at Inkerman, wild flowers grown in soil, nourished by blood and tears. Here's sweet-scented jasmine for the gangrenous, golden celandine cups for the thirsty, bright anemones for the undaunted, velvet violets for frostbitten fingers, sturdy stem daisies for the amputees, and fluffy tamarisk for the homesick and the blood-red poppy for five thousand hearts, five thousand sons asleep in Scutari's graveyard. Florence had always had a difficult relationship with her mother Fanny, who nursed a feeling of resentment against her daughter because of the spectacular life she had created for herself. By the mid-1860s, Fanny had become somewhat senile. She speaks the next poem, and it is called The Odour of Sanctity. She abandoned us, ashamed of the family that made hourly sacrifices on her behalf. Flo, so close to her papa, oh, he always took her side. It's an error. A very serious mistake to teach a girl mathematics. God's calling, she says, but would he call an educated woman from a family of good class to mix with vulgar, drunken nurses? Shut herself away after her war. No time to see dear old mum. Too much to write about. The army and nursing before she dies, and any moment she will die, she says. This Scutari sash stole flow from me, and I stole it from her. Something to keep, something of hers. Oh, it smells strange, not just musty. What is it, Turkish soap? Ah. Oh. Perhaps it's the scent of kindness to strangers. Or the reek of death. No, no, it's the odour of sanctity. Florence died on August the 10th, 1910. For the last 45 years of her life, she lived in a house in London, 10 South Street, Mayfair. The building was demolished in the 1920s and the replacement now bears a blue plaque. Florence had contracted brucellosis in the Crimea and eventually she became bedridden. 
However, from that house in South Street, she embarked on an enormously busy life in public affairs, championing and nurturing and advising on all kinds of worthy social causes, conducting operations from her bed. The house itself silted up with all the correspondence, letters and invitations and requests for advice which poured in from all over the world. In the next poem, the speaker is Florence's goddaughter, Florence Shaw, who herself was honoured for wartime nursing activities, but this after the 1914 war. The poem is called Snowdrift. The house holds its breath against a snowstorm of letters from family, friends, civil servants, admirers, grieving mothers. Some envelopes cling to seals, others perfumed by musk, many dog-eared or officially stamped, even patterned with inky paw prints from Flo's wayward cats. The ice flow silts up with faded reports, unfulfilled requisitions, stern memos to self, drafts anticipating her own death. Now papers curl like sickly skin, sigh into corners, drift against doors, creep under sofas, chase across surfaces like a panic of pigeons. Some sheaves whisper their disappointment as the power of her words heaps, shifts, settles, chilly as a shroud. In 1915, five years after Florence's death, a statue in her memory was erected with very little ceremony in Waterloo Place, London. Nearby stands a statue in honour of the Secretary of War, Sidney Herbert, the very man who had asked Florence to lead her corps of nurses to the Crimea. In this, the last poem, Florence, a ghost now, watches her statue being unveiled. The poem is called The Wrong Kind of Lamp. Early morning, away from public scrutiny, under the hush of February snow, in monumental Waterloo Place, crowded with the mighty depicted in granite and bronze, I watch, a ghost now, as four men pull down a tarpaulin, like circus folk lowering the big top to a reveal a likeness, perhaps a little flattering, of her whom they dub the Lady with the Lamp. But it's the wrong kind of lamp. It's an Aladdin pantomime prop. Not my Turkish fanus that shone its kindly light over my dear men at Scutari. And round the plinth are etched sanitised scenes of war's pain and squalor. If they had asked my advice, I would suggest that they spelt out some pertinent remonstrances from my notes on nursing. Prevention before cure. Cleanliness above all else. Wash your hands, wash your hands. But I won't croak out my complaints like a black sea cormorant, for they brought here from Pall Mall dear Sidney Herbert's pensive statue to join me here. Side by side, Sidney, like Darby and Joan on our matching plinths, we will fight on to win the war on health, for that is our Waterloo. <laughs> 